I think we can get started now. So I wanted to welcome everybody, and I know some will probably still be joining over the next several several minutes. But welcome everybody to today's collaboratory uh, speaker series. And I think we have a really interesting talk today. But before we get into that, um, I think, Lisa, can you go to the next slide? Okay, just wanna mention a couple of small housekeeping things. First is that the session is going to be closed captioned and recorded. The recording link will be shared with everybody and the, you know all the attendees and the registrants um, uh, on the LHS Collaboratory website. And we will have an audience Q&A, so you can enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A and we'll also try to have a, uh, a Q&A uh, more open afterwards for anybody who wants to ask questions. Um, as well. So today's program, again, I'm very excited, is a, called Supporting Clinical and Translational Research with Electronic Patient Data. Our speaker is Tom Campion, Jr., who leads Weill Cornell Medicine's efforts to support clinical and translational investigators with electronic patient data, especially through the electronic use of electronic health record data, or the secondary use of electronic health record data. Dr. Campion is Associate Professor of Research in Population Health Sciences in the Division of Health Informatics. As Chief Research Information Officer, as well as Director of Biomedical Informatics in the Clinical and Translational Science Center, he leads the Architecture for Research Computing and Health, or ARCH, A-R-C-H, program, which matches scientists with tools and services for obtaining electronic patient data. He's served as a co-investigator in multiple funded research initiatives, including NIH's Recover, N3C, ACT, and All of Us Research Program, as well as in PCORI's Insight Clinical Research Network. Nationally, he leads efforts to advance the secondary use of EHR data through the NIH, NIH CTSA Consortium, Clinical Research Forum IT Roundtable, and Association of, a Medical College, Association of American Medical Colleges Group on Information Resources. His research interests include electronic infrastructure to support clinical and translational scientists, measurement of the biomedical research enterprise, computable phenotyping, clinical decision support, health information exchanges, and organizational issues in informatics. He's a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association. He earned his master's and PhD degrees in biomedical informatics from Vanderbilt Uni University but most importantly for us, he received his undergrad degree from the University of Michigan. And with that, I will turn this over now to Tom, who uh, will give us a great talk. So thank you very much. Right. Uh, well, David, thank you very much um, uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, with everybody today. Um, uh, uh, I'm uh, happy to discuss you know, all things um, football, basketball, and hockey, but um, uh, first things first, uh, uh, let's dive into um, uh, the talk. Um, uh, so a little bit of what I'm going to uh, 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 present today is um, uh, first kind of framing the problem of supporting uh, uh, scientists with electronic patient data as we've conceptualized it um, at, at Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, uh, then I'll kind of go into a little bit of background. Um, uh, organizational context is always quite helpful, um, kind of illustrating um, uh, uh, some of the context in, in which uh, we've developed um, and delivered our approach. Um, this includes both some organizational characteristics of, of research computing, um, and then really tactically how we deliver something called architecture for research computing and health, or ARCH. Um, and I very much would like for this to be uh, a, a conversation. Um, uh, uh, feel free to, to ask questions in the, um, in the Q&A as we go along. And uh, David, feel free to, to interrupt as we go along. Um, but I think we'll have some time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, uh, but let's get going. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, as, as many of you know, um, getting data out of electronic health record or EHR systems um, uh, to support any type of analytics, um, the clinical and translational research in particular, is really hard. Um, and it's hard for a number of reasons. 
Uh, first and foremost, EHR systems um, are transactional. Um, they're not analytical. Um, uh, so we're constantly taking these patient care transactions that are really designed for, for billing first and foremost um, uh, uh, and clinical care um, uh, uh, secondarily, and then trying to repurpose these um, uh, into an analytical form um, uh, 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 to support research. You know, these transactions are really mirrored off of the um, uh, 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 workflow of yesteryear of um, you show up at the doctor's office and the doctor has a manila folder uh, containing uh, various sheets of paper um, uh, describing uh, you and your health and, and, and illness. That same approach um, uh, really exists in, in how uh, electronic health record systems are um, architected today. Um, uh, so they're really great for patient care and billing, um, but for research and analytics, it's 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 a it's a bit tougher. Um, uh, so in addition to the data uh, uh, needing to be transformed, um, it's often quite challenging as well um, because there are so many different tools to choose from. Um, uh, from what I recall, um, across Michigan Medicine, there is one EHR system to rule them all, more or less, and that's EPIC. Um, and it's pretty common these days in, in large academic medical system, medical centers. Um, but as, as much as, um, uh, you know, there's one system to rule them all for, for clinical care um, in, in EPIC, arguably, um, uh, there is no EPIC for clinical research. There's no one system to rule them all. Instead, there's a variety of different tools and services, and navigating those can be um, rather challenging. And that navigation is challenging um, because it's, it's important to understand the strengths and limitations of those systems, but also the underlying data from uh, the electronic health record. Investigators come uh, to our group all the time asking, can I do study X with data from the EHR? And I give the same unsatisfying answer every time of, well, it depends, uh, as we then explore things, which we'll go into uh, later today around, you know, structured versus unstructured data, uh, data quality, um, availability, um, and, and, and other factors. Um, and finally, um, uh, but, but perhaps most importantly, is the need to obtain regulatory approval uh, to conduct research. Patient privacy is of paramount importance, and it's really difficult to understand um, all the different hurdles that one must clear in order to conduct uh, a, a study um, in, in not only one institution, but also across multiple institutions. You know, this can involve obtaining approval from an institutional review board or IRB, as well as uh, uh, getting contracts approved uh, and, and other measures in place. Um, so taken together, this is a very complex socio-technical challenge. Um, and when you uh, uh, take a look across the literature, um, we really see that um, uh, optimal approaches are unknown. We don't know the best uh, ways to do this. And uh, in the field of biomedical informatics, um, we're constantly testing hypotheses to, to see what works um, and what doesn't um, to support the biomedical research enterprise with electronic patient data. And um, in particular, once you take a look at the field of biomedical informatics, um, uh, so the, 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 the subdiscipline of, of clinical research informatics or research informatics um, really uh, helps focus on helping investigators do three things. Um, uh, and uh, that's also how we've kind of oriented things at Well Cornell, as I'll illustrate as we go along. And those three things are um, to help investigators get data from the EHR, to collect novel measures that may not exist inside the EHR, and also to integrate data from disparate sources. As we go along, I'll try to illustrate um, uh, through example um, what all of this means. Um, but first, a bit of background. Um, uh, so, as you may know, um, Cornell University is a uh, Ivy League institution um, with its main campus in Ithaca, New York, uh, in upstate New York. Um, and, um, uh, however, um, it also has um, a, a medical school, um, uh, the Weill Cornell Medical College, uh, also doing business as Weill Cornell Medicine these days with uh, a, a change in branding from a few years back. Um, uh, although the main campus is in Ithaca, New York, while Cornell Medical College is located in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in, in New York City. Um, uh, the medical college um, uh, is really, you know, the biomedical research um, uh, education and, and patient care 
um, uh, unit of the university. Um, uh, and um, uh, notably, uh, it has a physician organization, um, you know, really doing business as well, Cornell Medicine these days, um, about 1,600 um, uh, 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 physicians uh, who are all faculty members of, of, the, of the college. Um, and uh, 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 the physician organization employs um, all of these, these doctors and also um, operates all of the outpatient practices, all of the doctor's offices um, throughout um, the metropolitan area. Um, and starting in about the year 2000, um, uh, the Wild Cornell physicians um, have all used EPIC as uh, the electronic health record system. Um, now, it's uh, important to point out something here of although uh, while Cornell employs physicians and, um, and operates uh, outpatient practices, while Cornell does not own its own hospital. Instead, uh, for a number of years, um, uh, we've had a, a longstanding uh, clinical uh, partnership with New York Presbyterian, which is uh, a major uh, multi-campus um, hospital system throughout the, 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 the region. Um, and for a very long time, um, uh, 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 New York Presbyterian ran all scripts, uh, Sunrise Clinical Manager, as the inpatient and emergency department uh, electronic medical record system. And although the data could flow back and forth between uh, the two institutions through a series of, of automated interfaces, we still really had two EHR systems, one on the outpatient side, one on the inpatient side. Now, uh, when you look across uh, town, at Columbia University, you see kind of the same sort of organizational arrangement of um, Columbia University as being a, a, a major uh, flagship institution, um, it having a, a medical school, um, the medical school uh, then having its own physician organization called Columbia Doctors, um, uh, and Columbia University critically also not owning its own hospital. Instead, um, having um, uh, 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 admitting privileges for its physicians at New York Presbyterian. Um, and for a long time, uh, Columbia doctors ran one Allscripts product on the uh, outpatient side of, um, of, of, of the enterprise. Um, and uh, there was a separate Allscripts um, uh, uh, system that ran uh, in the uh, inpatient setting for Columbia. Um, uh, uh, but then uh, about five years ago or so, uh, a decision was made to extend um, uh, uh, the Cornell Epic across all of these three institutions. Um, uh, so it's now one Epic implementation supporting Wild Cornell Medicine, Columbia, and New York Presbyterian. Um, uh, uh, this is a somewhat unusual um, organizational arrangement in which we have one hospital system with two competing physician organizations, with two competing medical schools, and two competing research enterprises, um, all sharing one electronic health record system. This is really, really um, outstanding for patient care, but it can add some complexity for, um, uh, for analytics and research in particular. We'll um, uh, 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 touch on some of that as we go along. Um, so the efforts that uh, I'm describing today are really oriented um, around the, the wild Cornell medicine sphere uh, of, of, of the New York Presbyterian system. Um, and to support um, uh, scientists with computational resources at wild Cornell medicine, um, we delivered um, a, a, a variety of services through our regular IT department. So the same group that provides networking, email, um, uh, uh, servers, security, project management, and so on. That's um, uh, uh, the, the group that, that provides all of the activities um, in support of scientists. Um, a lot of those activities I just described are represented in the, the, the gray box um, uh, here, uh, really the, the foundational elements of, 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 of traditional IT. And uh, on top of that foundation are three different divisions that really support um, uh, the, the, the spectrum of activities um, from the conduct to the administration of research. Um, so with respect to the conduct of research, um, uh, we have a, a, a scientific computing group um, that really provides all things high performance computing. And this is particularly helpful for the basic and translational science enterprise. Uh, where something like, say, a whole, a whole genome sequence for one patient, um, maybe one terabyte of data, um, uh, requiring a, a great deal of sophisticated um, storage and compute resources. Um, uh, kind of switching over to the, to the other side of the spectrum, 
a, a research administrative computing uh, team provides all the systems for compliance and planning. These are things like the IRB system, the grants and contract system, the clinical trials management system, pretty much everything about the research enterprise of, of um, who's involved, how's it getting paid for, um, uh, who can uh, uh, do th certain things and who can't. Um, and then in the middle is our research informatics uh, division, which brings together efforts uh, from, from, from our partners in scientific computing and research administrative computing, but also from uh, the clinical enterprise, um, which we'll get into here in just a moment. Um, so the, uh, the efforts of, 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 of these three um, uh, divisions um, plus other partners from across the, 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 this tripartite landscape of uh, Wild Cornell, Columbia, and New York Presbyterian, um, we deliver a suite of tools and services that we call um, uh, Architecture for Research, Computing, and Health, or ARCH. Um, uh, early in my career, I learned uh, that to succeed in academic medicine, you need lots of lousy acronyms. This is just one of many uh, uh, that we will see as, as we go along here today. Um, but uh, you can see that um, uh, 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 we have uh, conceptualized um, support for a variety of different studies um, spanning from um, uh, the study of populations uh, through uh, uh, the study of individuals, some cross-cutting activities, um, uh, but uh, 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 spanning uh, the, the, the length of the, the, the spectrum here as well, um, and other things that are far more targeted. Um, and in particular, our research informatics team focuses on the functions um, uh, described in these red boxes. And I remind our team all the time that science doesn't happen in the systems represented by these red boxes, which we'll get into in just a moment. Um, but science happens in a, in a statistical software package like SAS or Stata or R or Python or even Microsoft Excel. Um, uh, and what our job uh, uh, to do in research in informatics is to deliver data sets that are immediately amenable to statistical analysis in one of these types of packages. So we're oftentimes thinking about things in terms of rows and columns of data, because that's what those statistical software packages need um, so that um, uh, our faculty, staff, and students um, uh, can, can, can do what they're best at. Um, and that's doing things like uh, conducting epidemiological analyses, uh, generating new, uh, new, new models, really contributing to biomedical discovery. Um, uh, uh, that's what we really seek to enable. Um, but there's a, a JAMA article here um, uh, cited that I'm quite fond of that says, in academic medical centers, we're great at breakthrough, but we're lousy at follow through. That we're great at writing papers, getting grants, um, uh, and, and, and getting publicity, but uh, we don't take uh, the, 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 the learnings that we generate and put them back into practice. But that's what the electronic health record provides as a platform for taking our predictive models, for making interventions, for, for looking to, to, to push behavior um, uh, of, 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 of uh, physicians, other members of the care team, and patients um, uh, so that we can make change uh, in how uh, uh, healthcare um, is delivered. Um, and then we can get data back out. Uh, from the EHR so that we can understand um, uh, the results of our interventions. Did we make things better, worse, or have no effect? And to be able to do this um, using something like a, a secure computing enclave um, uh, to uh, further protect um, uh, 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 patient privacy. Um, so uh, uh, I mentioned that you know, the, the the red boxes manifest in, in many different tools and services, and you can kind of see um, uh, 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 some of that illustrated here. The purpose of this slide is not to look at it and understand um, uh, how any one individual can, can, can navigate all of these different options. Um, it's really to show that there is a veritable alphabet soup of product names, of, of acronyms um, that exist uh, when it comes to, 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 to clinical research and electronic patient data. And what our team does is really help investigators navigate this complex landscape um, so that they can uh, do what they need to do best. Um, to do this, um, uh, our division consists of, of three different sections. Um, one of which is, is data and software engineering. So it's the platform in which uh, 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 we do all of our work, um, ingesting data, um, uh, delivering a, a data warehouse and associated services. Um, and then there's kind of two investigator um, uh, focused areas. One is mm. data science services. 
um, uh, uh, really focused on. Look at that. Sorry, there was uh, uh, some yeah. some noise there for a moment. Um, uh, uh, but uh, the data science services really focused on uh, the secondary use of electronic health record data. Um, and uh, clinical and translational services, which is really uh, transactional systems in support of, of, of different scientific workflows, things like biobanking, uh, 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 consent, um, and um, uh, case report forms. Um, uh, just briefly, um, over time, we've um, uh, assembled an a, a automated ingest of data from a variety of different sources across Weill Cornell um, and New York Presbyterian um, uh, from both uh, uh, clinical and research systems. Um, and as we've uh, uh, kind of taken a look at this, of really seeing that what we're doing is we're taking raw data from these source systems and transforming it into, you know, research-ready data sets um, uh, uh, that uh, the tools that we were taking a look at on the previous slides um, uh, really are able to to make available to investigators. But this takes a, a, a lot of a lot of time, and um, uh, we've estimated that that more than uh, fifty percent of our time. Uh, across our team of, of 30 or so people um, is just focused on, on, on some of these uh, data engineering tasks. Um, uh, and this remains, uh, I think, a, a major challenge across the country um, and the globe uh, for how we um, best support investigators. Um, but kind of coming back to um, uh, the, the suite of tools and services here, um, I kind of want to walk through um, uh, 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 some of the options available. Um, and kind of the bread and butter, the bedrock of all of this is EHR reporting. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for, for quite some time, we've had um, two different EHR systems supported by two different uh, 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 legal entities from two different IT departments, um, uh, that being Epic and Allscripts before this uh, grand Epic consolidation. Um, uh, uh, but uh, through um, uh, collaboration of New York Presbyterian, Columbia, and Cornell, um, we were able to come up with something called the uh, uh, the Tripartite Request Assessment Committee, or TRAC, uh, which really serves as a front door, a single place to go um, and request data um, to then um, uh, kind of get some of that guesswork um, out of the way for investigators. So there's just one place where they can request data, um, and then the fulfillment of that uh, of those data requests um, uh, uh, happens kind of behind the scenes. Um, uh, that's a little bit about how it's organized. Um, but the way that really works is illustrated um, here. So what we're looking at um, uh, on screen um, is uh, the data from the Epic Clarity Reporting Database. Um, this is the underlying data um, uh, uh, coming out of Epic. Uh, and you'll notice, um, and I talked about rows and columns of data earlier. What we're looking at here are rows and columns of data as well. Um, uh, we've uh, uh, blurred out, um, uh, obfuscated um, uh, some uh, uh, fields here, like patient numbers and encounter numbers. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, think about rows and columns of data. You know, each patient has, you know, say one identifier, a, a patient number, um, and they have, may have, you know, one or more encounters. Um, so these data elements start kind of taking shape like this. Um, with a variety of columns uh, uh, also describing things. And you, know, you kind of take a look here, you see a, a column called DXID, been around med medicine enough, you might kind of look at that and say, oh, I bet that stands for diagnosis ID. But looking at that number, that number doesn't make any sense to a human. That is a machine readable value. It, um, it is not human readable. And it's only when you join in data from another source, like let's say a lookup table containing uh, ICD-9 codes, that the data start to take on um, uh, some meaning for humans. So here um, uh, uh, we've we've joined in ICD-9 codes, um, and yeah, I know enough that uh, when we look at that first row um, uh, that says 250.60, that anything in that 250 range of ICD-9 codes corresponds to diabetes. Um, but as we kind of look at this data set, you know, thinking that investigators want rows and columns of data, is this really what they're looking for? Probably not. Um, instead, what they might be looking for is um, like this example on screen of instead of you know each row being its own diagnosis code that you know maybe each row is one patient um, with a variety of of demographic characteristics um, and maybe dichotomous variables uh, corresponding to um, uh, 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 whether a comorbidity is present or not. 
Um, so, you know, kind of then crafting some rules, um, you know, based on what we just saw on the previous slide of, um, you know, do they have a, a, a an ICD-9 code in that 250 range? If so, um, make sure that that uh, dichotomous variable um, appears as a yes for diabetes. We could go through and repeat this for other comorbidities and also do this um, uh, for uh, uh, with other elements um, uh, from the, the, the EHR, things like medications, um, uh, uh, smoking status, and so on. Um, you know, it's not to say that you know investigators are only interested in, in dichotomous variables. This is just one type of example. Um, but what I hope this example really helps illustrate is the the need for transforming that raw data into a research ready representation, something that more clearly matches how investigators are thinking about um, uh, 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 how to conduct studies um, and what those data elements need to really look like as features um, in a statistical model. Um, so this uh, process that we've just uh, uh, gone over um, really involves a back and forth with a database analyst to generate these exact um, specifications for creating something like a, a, an Excel spreadsheet containing rows and columns of data. But lots of times investigators um, uh, don't have the time to go through that, and um, they're really at a, an earlier start, an earlier phase um, in the research process. There's uh, something called you know, uh, preparatory to research of just needing to know, do we have enough patients meeting particular criteria um, to do a study? And uh, 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 for a number of years, um, uh, an effort out of um, uh, Partners Healthcare and um, uh, Harvard Medical School called uh, I2B2, um, or Informatics for Integrating Biology in the Bedside, I told you there would be more bad acronyms, um, uh, has been uh, quite popular among um, uh, CTSA hubs um, across the NIH. Um, and uh, you may be familiar with I2B2, it looks something like this. Um, and with I2B2, essentially, you take all of your data from electronic health record and other systems, transform it into a particular format, um, uh, very likely de-identify it. Um, and then with other uh, uh, IRB protocol approvals in place, um, you may be able to make it available to all investigators at your institution without them needing to get individual IRB uh, uh, protocol approval because the, the, the system is enabling investigators to kind of browse clinical data in a in a, um, a, a hierarchical format, as you can see here, um, and then point and click, um, and in a matter of seconds, see how many patients um, ever had particular uh, 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 elements recorded um, uh, in, in, in their patient record in the EHR. Uh, so here we see that, um, you know, a search for um, uh, any patients who ever had a, an ICD-9 code in the 250 range yields about 70,000 patients, and that just takes a couple of seconds. Um, this can uh, really, really help um, uh, uh, accelerate time to science so that um, investigators can know, yes, we can do this study, whether locally um, in partnership with investigators from other institutions um, uh, or in collaborations with industry. Um, uh, uh, so what I2B2 has, has really focused on is structured data of um, how do we search these, these types of things um, uh, using things like ICD-9 and 10 codes, uh, CPT codes for procedures, quantitative laboratory results, and, and so on, um, uh, where uh, it does not have uh, full um, support yet is in uh, uh, the use of unstructured data. And that's um, where we've been working very closely with Dr. Hanauer. Uh, to help implement EMERS, um, uh, uh, which has come out of um, uh, 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 the University of Michigan, um, the Electronic Medical Record Search Engine, um, which is kind of like I2B2, um, uh, but for unstructured notes, um, uh, things like physician notes, uh, pathology reports, radiology reports. Um, I'll come back a little bit later to text analytics, um, but this is something we are um, uh, in the process of implementing at, at Wild Cornell and very excited about. Um, so, uh, kind of um, one limitation of uh, the way that we've implemented I2B2 uh, and EMERS um, at our institution is it just contains data for our institution, um, which can be particularly challenging um, in a, a, a city environment where care is so fragmented. Um, uh, for example, I could see my primary care physician at Cornell, but my endocrinologist is at Mount Sinai, um, and uh, my cardiologist is um, at, at NYU, 
uh, and I, I fell down, I hit my head, and I ended up admitted um, uh, uh, in the hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx. Um, being able to study uh, the continuum of care um, across so many different um, organizations is quite challenging, and bringing that data together um, uh, uh, can 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 help overcome those those barriers. Um, with funding from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI, um, uh, while Cornell is um, uh, 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 leaders of the Insight Clinical Research Network, part of PCORinet. Uh, and what this does is bring together all of the electronic health record data from all of the major academic medical centers in New York City in one database. Uh, Renu Koshal, um, who's the, the Chair of Population Health Sciences and Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Research, is the PI of, um, of the Insight Network. Um, and this is just a monumental achievement to bring together all these um, uh, clinical competitors um, uh, to say, you know, the right thing for research is to share these data elements. Um, and this has been going on since about 2014 um, and has enabled a, 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 a huge amount of, 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 of discovery and research over time. Um, uh, uh, so um, another um, multi-institutional um, data sharing initiative in which we participate is with a company um, uh, uh, called Trinetics, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, and Trinetics uh, quite cleverly um, uh, noted that um, those counts of patients um, uh, that are displayed in a privacy-preserving manner in, in I2B2 um, that really help with activities preparatory to research that don't require IRB protocol approval, those are really valuable um, uh, for faculty members in academic med medical centers, but they could also be incredibly valuable um, uh, 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 for pharmaceutical sponsors. Um, and uh, uh, starting with our I2B2 data a number of years ago, um, uh, we have enabled um, uh, through uh, participation in Trinetics, the ability for uh, pharma to query our, our data um, uh, and get counts of patients. They don't get um, uh, uh, individual uh, rows and columns level data, just counts of patients. Um, so it continues to preserve privacy. Um, uh, and um, on the basis of those counts, uh, uh, Trinetics then serves as, as a middleman of sorts um, uh, for major uh, pharmaceutical uh, sponsors and uh, contract research organizations, um, which will then reach out and say, we ran a, a study uh, or a, a query. It appears that you have 500 patients meeting um, uh, potential eligibility, eligibility criteria for a phase two study of uh, drug X. Um, are you interested in participating? We received um, uh, 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 more than 350 requests uh, in the four or five years that we've been doing this, and about 20% um, are of interest to our investigator community. And every year we ask our, our clinical trials office, do you want to keep doing this? Do you want to keep using Trinetics? And they said, yes, we're getting clinical trial opportunities that we wouldn't ordinarily have gotten. Um, and the outstanding part of Trinetics is um, we do not pay uh, Trinetics anything. Trinetics does not pay us anything. Um, instead, uh, we get the potential upside of, um, uh, of, of new therapeutics coming to patients um, at the institution um, in, in alignment with uh, uh, the, the medical college's mission. Um, so Trinetics has been uh, really great for helping us expand support for sponsor-initiated trials. Um, and um, we've also pursued um, through, with, uh, uh, through uh, the NIH um, the ACT network um, uh, to help uh, the accru accrual the clinical trials network um, to help grow investigator initiated trials. Um, and what this does um, is kind of connect all of the different I2B2 implementations from across the country um, uh, through a network called Shrine. Um, uh, this has been going on for about five years, still kind of in, in the experimental phase, um, but you can kind of see the same sort of user interface here. Um, uh, I think this is a query for how many patients have diabetes or a, an ICD-10 code for diabetes. Um, and you can see that in a matter of seconds um, uh, from across the country, um, you are able to start seeing how many patients may have particular clinical um, uh, criteria as documented in the EHR. Um, this is a, 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 a great way of, of growing multi-institutional investigator-initiated trials um, uh, uh, across uh, the country. Um, um, uh, so, um, kind of uh, uh, as we've moved forward, um, we've seen a need also to, to cater not just to clinical trialists, um, uh, not just to tell services researchers, um, but increasingly um, to help uh, support the needs of, of, you know, kind of data scientists who, who seek big data. 
Um, we kind of took a look at some of the data from, from the Epic Clarity um, uh, 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 database earlier. Um, there are some challenges there. Um, and as uh, we're getting more and more uh, requests from, in, from these kind of data scientists, these big data um, uh, types of researchers, they were saying, you know, we want all of the EHR data, quote unquote. We're saying, well, you know, there's probably, you know, 14,000, if not more, kind of proprietary database tables from Epic. Um, it, 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 it might be a, a great deal of work for you to have to um, uh, navigate all of those to do anything useful. Um, and as you know, we we're kind of reflecting on, on uh, popular opinion and um, kind of the direction of data science around kind of janitor work of transforming data. Um, we really saw that uh, through uh, the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics or Odyssey Consortium led by Columbia University and, and Janssen Pharmaceuticals, um, that using something called the OMOP Common Data Model or Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, um, that you know we might be able to provide everything that people actually need. Um, uh, uh, using a, a rather uh, elegantly um, uh, uh, formed uh, common data model consisting of about 20 different standardized uh, 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 tables, you know, looking at things of like person, uh, visit occurrence, um, uh, corresponding to an encounter, um, a drug exposure, a condition occurrence, uh, referring to uh, uh, a, a diagnosis code, and all of this then being mapped um, to standardized vocabularies, things like link codes for um, uh, laboratory results, SNOMED codes um, for, for conditions um, uh, and procedures, um, uh, as well as uh, being able to have mappings for things like ICD-9 and 10, and 10, co 10, 10 codes as well. Um, uh, uh, and the outstanding part about uh, the uh, about the OMOP common data model and the o and the Odyssey network is if at your academic medical center you implement OMOP according um, uh, uh, to to the standard, and at my academic medical center I implement OMOP according to to the standard. What we can do is um, conduct uh, studies across uh, institutional barriers just by sharing uh, our code. Um, uh, and being able to perform aggregate analyses. And the best part is we don't have to engage lawyers um, because we're not actually having data um, uh, across institutional boundaries. Um, this has been um, uh, incredibly valuable for uh, running a, a number of, of, of global studies um, uh, and also helping to, to I think, uh, introduce more data scientists um, uh, to the, 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 the complexities of electronic health record data, but also what they can do with it um, um, uh, uh, by, by using standards. Um, so uh, uh, the value of what we've seen um, from, from Odyssey and the OMOP um, common data model has also extended to, um, to other multi-institutional data sharing initiatives, um, one of which is uh, the NIH All of Us Research Program, which um, endeavors to enroll um, uh, 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 one million people living in America um, to donate their um, uh, 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 electronic health record data, along with um, uh, blood specimens for, for sequencing um, and um, uh, lifestyle data collected through through things like like surveys and potentially Fitbits um, to really, really create one large cohort study um, uh, 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 for the country. I kind of view it as kind of like a, a, a 21st century version of, of, of the, the Framingham Heart Study, um, almost a, a Framingham meets 23andMe. Um, uh, but undergirding uh, the All of Us Research Program effort is the OMOP Common Data Model. Um, and um, it has been exceptionally exciting to see uh, what's called the, 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 the researcher workbench um, uh, take, uh, take off in, in recent years of all of the data um, uh, uh, collected and contributed by academic medical centers um, and participants um, is now available um, through a secure um, uh, web enclave. Um, uh, called the Researcher Workbench, um, uh, with kind of different uh, tiers of access, um, with kind of uh, 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 ranging from not needing any IRB uh, protocol approval to needing um, heightened IRB protocol approval and maybe um, uh, signing of other other documents for other assurances. Um, but as you can see um, uh, here in this example, um, uh, this has enabled um, investigators to use, you know, uh, standard anal analytical tools like a Jupyter notebook um, to generate sunburst plots, um, you know, against data from the OMOP common data model. Um, and it's just outstanding to see um, uh, the confluence of efforts of 
of, 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 of standards uh, being made in biomedical informatics, um, uh, you know, uh, tools and approaches um, like OMOP um, and all of this coming together uh, with patient consent um, to make these new resources um, uh, uh, to help advance activities um, in, in the country and across the world. It's um, uh, really, really uh, uh, quite amazing. Um, another example of this led by the NIH uh, is something called the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C. Um, uh, N3C also leverages the uh, OMOP common data model. Um, and the, the, the statistics on the left side of the screen here are a little bit um, out of date, uh, but early in the pandemic, um, uh, NIH saw a need to start bringing together um, uh, uh, data from uh, really across the country um, in a secure enclave, um, similar to the All of Us Research Program, but done um, uh, in, uh, uh, at a broader scale um, for you know, all patients um, uh, uh, treated for or suspected of COVID, along with some controls, um, and using a, uh, a waiver of consent and HIPAA authorization, have been able to um, amass um, a, a very large data set for um, uh, more than 14 million patients, um, uh, and then enabling uh, the query of these data um, uh, uh, using um, uh, structured query language or SQL um, against uh, the OMOP data, uh, which you can see in um, in the screenshot here from the the secure enclave. Again, um, an excellent example of of, of uh, uh, standards and in informatics uh, coming together, especially in um, the biggest uh, public health crisis of our time. Um, um, so, um, kind of coming back to this big data analytics. Um, uh, another um, huge um, uh, uh, area of, of growth um, over time and, and um, especially now is around natural language processing or NLP. Um, and um, uh, as we uh, uh, discussed briefly earlier, um, EHR data can loosely be categorized into two types, structured, you know, things like, uh, like diagnosis codes, procedure codes, and unstructured. Um, and those are really, um, you know, notes, um, physician notes, pathology reports, radiology reports. Um, and uh, those notes are a gold mine of, of, of what's going on with patients. Um, but there can be so much variation in the way that uh, physicians document. Um, and that's why natural language processing is important to, to get these elements out. We've led um, uh, a variety of, of NLP efforts over time um, in uh, coordination with clinical colleagues across a, a number of different areas, um, you know, to support uh, uh, some mental health research um, uh, 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 activities in, in cancer as well. Um, but one um, uh, example um, uh, is um, uh, really focused on, on um, uh, underrepresented populations. Um, so. Uh, uh, as we looked at the electronic health record data um, at our institution, we saw that about 50% of patients did, um, did not have a structured value um, for race or ethnicity. Um, and that oftentimes there was either nothing specified, it was null, um, or it, it was declined. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so it just re really wasn't useful. Um, it was also unclear of, you know, did a patient actually decline um, or did a registration clerk um, just, you know, quickly click through different screens um, and, and selected declined. Um, but kind of looking at an example, as we see here, of a patient um, uh, with uh, race and ethnicity values declined in the EHR, um, but then when we would kind of look up uh, the patient's um, uh, notes, we would see, oh, it's a 48-year-old AA female, um, which may actually mean 48-year-old African-American female. So we posited that we could maybe, you know, kind of uh, fill in the gaps um, by using uh, NLP of notes um, um, uh, uh, to help um, uh, 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 get uh, values of race and ethnicity. And we were able to improve identification of, of patients who may be Black or Hispanic um, uh, by more than 20%. Um, uh, and this, uh, we described this in a, in a Jamia article uh, a few years back. Um, uh, and uh, this um, uh, was primarily uh, motivated to improve uh, clinical trial enrollment. Um, uh, for a, a, a study team at the institution uh, that was seeking uh, to address a huge need, and that's that um, uh, uh, clinical trials often um, uh, uh, do not include um, uh, patients from traditionally underrepresented populations. Uh, and with this mechanism, 
uh, we were able to potentially address some of uh, that gap. Um, so, so much of what I've described so far has been kind of on the, the retrospective or population-based um, uh, uh, side of the spectrum, um, kind of uh, switching gears to the other side of, um, you know, maybe perhaps more prospective data collection um, or, you know, focused on individuals. Um, and, and one tool uh, that uh, has been uh, indispensable um, is REDCap or, you know, Research Electronic Data Capture um, uh, created by um, the folks at Vanderbilt. Um, and over time, um, with kind of um, uh, working, uh, uh, following Vanderbilt's guide, um, we've been able to um, further bring together uh, clinical and research workflows um, uh, using uh, something that at Bell Cornell we've, we've branded as Super REDCap. Um, and then kind of uh, gone further um, uh, uh, through things with the FIRE standard for something called Super REDCap on FIRE. Um, so briefly, uh, if you're not familiar with REDCap, it's kind of like a, a, a do-it-yourself case report form um, and survey tool. It's kind of like a survey monkey for research. Um, and um, with, with Super REDCap or Dynamic Data Poll, um, as it's called um, uh, officially by Vanderbilt, um, if you enter in, say, a medical record number, um, a prompt will uh, ask if you uh, want to go and retrieve data elements um, from a remote source system like an electronic health record system. Um, and what it'll do is go, uh, as shown in this example, retrieve things like a first name, last name, and date of birth uh, for a test patient, um, uh, pressing save, those elements come back in. Um, and from what uh, uh, study teams have said to us, this helps um, save time and um, reduce data entry error um, uh, when combined with a, um, a date uh, of service, it will all also then go and kind of retrieve these so-called temporal values, uh, things like laboratory results, um, so that a, a study team can select you know, this um, uh, platelet as, a, as opposed to that platelet. Um, uh, so much of, of, of what ends up happening with electronic health record data, they were kind of annotating it. Um, and uh, this really helps kind of, you know, with that transformation from raw to, 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 to research ready data. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we were among the um, uh, first institutions uh, to roll out uh, Super Red Cap on Fire, uh, which launches inside of EPIC, um, uh, the electronic health record system um, at the institution. This is a screenshot there. Um, but as um, we kind of took a look um, uh, a number of years ago, um, we would see that investigators would have, um, you know, a spreadsheet uh, that they exported from REDCap uh, for a particular cohort. And then they had, um, you know, another spreadsheet that they got for the EPIC reporting team describing, say, um, you know, uh, outpatient um, uh, visit characteristics. Uh, uh, then they had uh, yet another spreadsheet um, from uh, the inpatient electronic health record system. Um, and then uh, yet another spreadsheet from, say, the perioperative information system and, and so on, and just, you know, drowning in spreadsheets. And we kind of looked at this and said, there's got to be a better way. Um, uh, and the approach that we devised was something uh, that we've called research data repositories, um, whereby, uh, considering, say, emergency medicine as an example, um, we would bring together all of the data from all of the source systems of interest um, and regularly refresh that, probably do that um, uh, 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 using identified data um, uh, and um, then deploy three different tools to support three different workflows. And in I2B2 and Super Redcap, we kind of went over, um, but that, that, that final one of um, analysis is really focused on creating those rows and columns level data sets um, and really trying to do this, um, thinking about how do we do this for two studies, um, uh, kind of families of studies to get started, and then building uh, that out over time. Um, this is kind of our, our premium offering. All of the other tools and services we've taken a look at um, uh, are largely um, uh, available free of charge to investigators. Um, but with these research data repositories, these RDRs, um, uh, we really position these as opportunities for partnerships um, uh, and that um, uh, to get started with these, investigators needed um, uh, to apply for a subsidy um, and uh, also uh, contribute $50,000 um, to start. Um, uh, and then pay a, a $7,500 annual maintenance fee. Um, these uh, fees come nowhere close to recovering our costs, uh, but they really ensure that investigators have some kind of investment, some kind of um, uh, you know, skin in the game. Um, and this has been quite successful over time. You see, I don't know, close to 20 of these that we've done. I think this list is, um, is somewhat out of date. Um, 
uh, uh, this has worked really well um, in, in, in some instances. In some instances, um, we, we haven't achieved the, the, the same levels of gains. Um, in some places, uh, we had uh, physicians start uh, learning to, to, to write their own code, um, which was a, a, a massive um, uh, achievement. Um, uh, but what we've been able to generate through these are research ready data sets um, that, you know, we've had clinical expertise, uh, clinical experts engaged early um, to help define um, this is what these, th these things need to look like um, and uh, creating data assets for other people across the institution to use these. I'll get into it in a little bit, um, but a lot of the work that we did um, uh, with uh, our pediatric, or I'm sorry, with our uh, critical care team um, focused on sepsis research years ago, then became kind of the, the centerpiece of um, our COVID-19 uh, response efforts as well. And all of this we have um, uh, documented in, in what we call the data catalog. Um, so, you know, I mentioned COVID um, and kind of the same uh, sets of activities that we'd had in place for the research enterprise. Um, we then put in place to support not just uh, COVID research, but COVID clinical response. Um, so kind of the same architectural approach of recognizing that there's data from disparate sources that we needed to bring together um, and that um, uh, we kind of had to make some calls on our own of how to organize the data to make it um, uh, more easily accessible. So we took an approach that we kind of called the poor man's OMOP of, of simplifying things a little bit, um, really aiming to support a variety of different types of use cases, not just research, um, and then kind of wrapping um, our, our regular approach for engagement um, uh, and um, working closely with our IT um, uh, colleagues to make sure that uh, security and, and identity and access management um, uh, were all properly accounted for um, and really making uh, this data uh, available to investigators across the institution at a scale uh, that we'd never seen before, um, largely driven by investigators um, running their own uh, SQL queries. Um, we were able to, to publish a paper describing some of these efforts um, kind of seeing uh, a concordance between data we were able to um, extract in an automated fashion from the EHR system versus a, a, a variety of, of data elements that um, uh, 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 were manually captured early in the pandemic um, that, that formed a, a great deal of uh, 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 early response efforts. Um, uh, this effort uh, also included um, a variety of, of informational resources um, uh, including uh, a SharePoint uh, site um, with guidance of how to then um, obtain data and biospecimens to support further research. Um, so in the, the ARCH model has um, uh, really helped us engage the investigator community across a variety of different um, uh, 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 types of study designs over time. And um, there's um, you know, some things that we've learned um, in, the, in the course of, of, of delivering uh, the suite of tools and services. Um, and a big part of that is that um, uh, there's different needs for, for different types of studies, different types of investigators. The, the needs of a clinical trialist are completely different from, say, your big data scientist um, uh, uh, who you know, wants pixel information from, from images um, who are, or who wants all of the blood glucose data um, uh, out of the EHR. Um, uh, those are really different scientific orientations, um, but as we aim to support the needs of the enterprise, um, we need to make sure that we're providing informatic support, not just for informaticians, um, not just for, for data scientists, um, but for everybody. Um, uh, and there's a, a, a great number of skills that are necessary here. Um, and, you know, one of my mentors always um, uh, emphasized that the hardest part about research is asking the right question, um, and uh, that continues to be um, a, a major challenge in supporting the needs of the research enterprise as well. Not everyone has formal training in research methods, um, and as an academic medical center, you know, we want to um, uh, uh, contribute to that teaching mission, um, uh, but it's really hard um, uh, just because we have data um, and people have approval um, to share the data, um, it's still work to do that. Um, you know, how do we really want to go about um, allocating our resources? Um, you know, getting more and more people involved in, in these activities too, um, uh, uh, helping folks understand, you know, this isn't just, you know, data and informatics. Biostatistics and study design are, are major, major parts of, of, of successful um, initiatives. 
um, and that the, the data underlying all of this is, you know, very likely stored in a relational database management system, um, and that SQL programming um, is really hard, and there's, there's this uh, very um, uh, uh, complex challenge of thoughtfully interrogating clinical data, um, and just kind of understanding how all of the data fits together, um, and how some of these elements may not exist uh, in the EHR, or they require a, a great deal of, of transformation um, through things like natural language processing or other measures um, uh, to really get them to be research ready and always kind of, you know, revisiting this question of, is the juice worth the squeeze, um, so to speak? Um, uh, but we've also seen that um, um, uh, 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 there's a great amount of value that comes about by bringing together a troika of roles, and that's clinician, biostatistician, and informatician of a clinician um, or other scientists providing, um, you know, really the, 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 the research question, the scientific goals, and the informatician um, helping to provide data and, um, and, and guidance around um, uh, uh, what people can do um, and what may be challenging uh, uh, to, to do with the data, um, and then a biostatistician to kind of keep everyone honest and keep everyone focused on, okay, what are the statistical methods that we're looking to use? What are our dependent independent variables? Um, and that really kind of helps um, uh, uh, focus the entire effort. Um, and it's, you know, we've kind of looked at, at, at the amount of effort that goes into these things of delivering custom data sets. You know, we get people exactly what they need, um, but uh, it can take longer. Um, whereas with some of these common data models, um, we can really deliver, um, you know, a resource uh, that covers a, a broad set of use cases, but it might not cover everything. Um, and it's always kind of this question of, of, of from with respect to resource allocation, what's the best way of doing this? Um, and finally, um, the the the, uh, the need for regulatory approval um, remains um, rather complex, um, and uh, you know our team has developed a fair bit of 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 understanding, and in some cases even expertise with things like uh, the HIPAA privacy rule over time. Um, but uh, this is really hard um, uh, for most investigators uh, to be able to follow, and you know really should they have to be experts in this. Probably not. Um, there's this concept from clinical medicine uh, that, that that I really like of performing at the top of your license. Um, and I think uh, uh, what we want to do in informatics is make sure that um, uh, our, our, our clinician scientists and other scientist colleagues, that they can really perform at the top of their license um, as researchers um, and that we can really help provide guidance, um, not just for, 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 for technology and, and data matters, um, but potentially also uh, for some of the regulatory matters because they can they really take a a, a, a long time sometimes. Um, so kind of to to wrap things up, um, there's really three things um, that we've conceptualized research informatics is helping investigators do, and it's to get data out of EHR systems, to collect novel uh, uh, research measures that may not exist in the EHR. Um, and finally, to integrate data from, um, from disparate sources, um, all towards uh, uh, creating research-ready data sets. A lot of this work involves this quote-unquote janitor work of um, you know, data munging, data cleaning. Um, uh, that's um, a, 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 a hugely expensive operational task and also a really big um, a, a part of kind of fundamental um, uh, research in biomedical informatics today. Um, Self-service tools are critical to all of this. Things like I2P2, things like REDCap, things like EMERS, where never it's going to be very, very difficult to have enough people to be able to respond to, to all of the individual um, uh, requests that come up over time from, from the research enterprise. Um, uh, and it's an ongoing challenge of um, you know, where do we place our resources. Um, I think we probably need a combination of self-service tools. Um, and investigator engagement to, to help boost data literacy, um, but the tooling uh, can potentially help um, uh, uh, with, with, with some of the capacity, but we still want to make sure that people can interrogate data thoughtfully. Um, uh, 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 another aspect of this, too, um, that we've really been working with the investigator community locally on is to understand um, that data from the electronic health record system at Weill Cornell Medicine are available free of charge uh, to the research enterprise, but thoughtful interrogation of data, that's going to carry a cost um, through either, you know, a, a chargeback from our informatics group, um, you know, buying some of the time of a biostatistician who may have um, uh, the requ requisite uh, technical skills, um, or for those investigators who have technical skills, 
you know, their time still um, uh, uh, is money. Um, and um, uh, these things, um, uh, we need to make sure that we allocate our resources appropriately. Um, so kind of looking at what we've um, set out to do um, and what we've observed through, through, uh, through ARCH is with this suite of tools and services, um, we've been able to, to, to help bring investigators um, uh, 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 to see all of these different options um, and for us to kind of help um, uh, with some of that work um, to match them with the right tools and services with respect to things like study design, uh, data sources, uh, regulatory approval and cost. And there's all sorts of times when investigators have come to us and said, I need I2B2. And then we sit down and we talk to them and we find out, oh no, you, you actually need REDCap. Um, or times when investigators have said, I've got a check for $50,000, let's go build a custom research data repository. Um, and then we kind of uh, sit down and see, no, you're not quite ready for that. Um, you know, an I2B2 query and um, uh, followed by uh, an EHR report is what you need um, uh, to get started. And, you know, you should probably use that money to fund a research coordinator. Um, and that's a, a great example of, of, of providing uh, value to the institution uh, and to the, the research enterprise. Um, uh, it takes a village uh, to, to deliver uh, uh, this type of, of service and to do research on top of it. I'm incredibly appreciative of all of the efforts of, of our team, um, uh, the leadership um, uh, uh, guidance that we've received from uh, Drs. Cole, Koshal, and uh, Imperato McGinley, um, uh, and the funding we've received um, uh, from the NIH through our Clinical and Translational Science Award, um, as well as our local Joint Clinical Trials Office. Um, I think we're about time. Um, here's some of my contact information, um, and I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions or comments. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I think there was a lot of interest and a lot of engagement, and I can tell because of the number of questions we have in the Q&A. I really didn't try to interrupt you because it seems like you were in such a role when you were talking, but I really, again, I want to thank you. We actually do have time until 1.30, so for anybody who wants to stick around, maybe we can go through some questions. Maybe we'll start with the Q&A that's been put through Zoom, and then we can go to some maybe some open-ended questions if people want to just ask and have a discussion, if that's okay. So what I'll do is I'll just start to, to go through some of these questions, and, and I'll let you start to answer them. So question number one, uh, that I see in the open questions is what standard organizations, HL7, OMOP, CDISC, et cetera, do you see as having any potential in leveraging real world, real world data, RWD, from the EHR for secondary use? Uh, great question. Uh, my uh, easy answer is all of the above. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, the the, the work that the Odyssey Consortium has done um, uh, with the OMAP common data model, I think is um, incredibly, incredibly um, uh, illustrative of um, uh, the power that real world data can have. Um, George Ripsack, the, 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 the longtime chair at uh, Columbia University, um, Department of Biomedical Informatics, um, uh, uh, who's recently transitioned into a different role um, at Columbia, um, has uh, a great uh, uh, track record um, uh, from his time leading a variety of initiatives um, uh, in Odyssey of, you know, bringing together data um, uh, around kind of post-market surveillance of, um, of particular medications <clears throat> uh, 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 during the pandemic um, and, and outside of COVID. Um, and uh, it just shows the value of, of, of what we can do with all of this. Um, I just think that's a, a, a huge example of this. I think, um, um, you know, CDISC is, is very interesting as well. You know, more and more interest from, um, uh, from, from pharmaceutical sponsors to try to get data out of the EHR um, uh, 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 for clinical trials. I still think there's a great deal of, 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 of challenge there. Um, there's always this question of um, what is our capacity for error? Um, and for a lot of things like OMOP, yeah, you know, the law of, of large numbers is on our side. For things like uh, clinical trials, um, where we, we don't have um, uh, such a, a high capacity for error, uh, the threshold is much lower, um, uh, it, 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 it gets a little bit tougher. Um, but 
you know, the, these same types of approaches um, uh, uh, from, from Odyssey have also been huge in things like N3C um, and now the Recopper Initiative as well. Great. Next question. Do you work with health librarians at Cornell on repository access and design? Yes, uh, great question. Um, we work very closely with our library. Um, the library is one of the um, uh, divisions uh, of our of our IT department, so we're kind of um, uh, uh, all alongside each other. And um, uh, uh, the data catalog that I referred to um, is a service delivered um, uh, by our health librarians. We've also worked very closely um, uh, uh, with our uh, library leadership, uh, Terry Wheeler, who some of you may know as the library director, um, uh, is um, uh, 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 leading our efforts around um, the NIH data management and sharing uh, policy that recently went into effect, um, as well as kind of in general around some some other uh, data retention uh, work. So um, it's a, a, a great partnership that we have with our library co colleagues. Thank you. So next question um, from Diane Harper. What do we need to increase the number of physicians who are trained to do this kind of research, physician investigator people, not clinicians? Uh, wow, uh, these questions are, are, are outstanding. Um, um, I think some of it is uh, formal training um, that I, I don't know of too many training programs. Um, uh, for physician investigators um, outside of, of informatics training programs. And even then, um, uh, 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 not that many even in informatics training programs that involve, you know, getting into the, um, the details of electronic health record data, the details of OMOP data, um, to be able to, to think about um, electronic health record data, to be able to think about you know, there's this reciprocal relationship of a research question and your data source and how your data source can then kind of um, adjust the way that you're asking your research question. And then as you continue adjusting your research question, it then kind of um, uh, changes the way that you look at and interact with with the available data you have. Um, understanding that is 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 really hard. Um, uh, uh, formal training um, through a degree program or a certificate program uh, or a fellowship is one way of doing it. Um, the research data repositories that we talked about, that's actually like a huge thing that's come out of that, of um, uh, in some of these engagements where we've worked very closely with a physician um, uh, who may not have had those skills, um, uh, then working very closely with our team um, and, um, uh, and developing those skills in the process. Um, um, uh, we're also looking to develop a new um, uh, course um, in research informatics. Um, where hopefully we can engage with some of these physician scientists type folks um, and also uh, with people who may not be physicians who might be more like a master's level person um, so that they can help serve as that interface. Um, uh, it's going to take a village um, uh, and I don't think we can um, expect uh, nor do we want all physicians um, uh, to become um, you know, great SQL programmers. Thank you. Our next question is, with respect to multi-institutional data sharing, do you all do any research, research related work with the New York eHealth Collaborative or does Insight fulfill that use case? Ah, great question. Um, and the New York eHealth Collaborative uh, goes back to the beginning of my career. I originally came to Cornell to um, work on evaluation of um, health information exchange efforts across New York State. Um, uh, 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 Insight uh, partnered um, with Healthix, um, which is a, a big health information exchange um, in New York City, um, uh, toward the uh, beginning of, um, of, of, of the network's existence. Um, that's kind of transitioned a bit, but we continue kind of looking at, at ways that we can work um, with Healthix and the other health information exchange efforts uh, uh, across New York City and New York State um, as they're very rich resources. Fantastic. Next question. Have you heard of, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it Truveta? Truvita, Truveta. Do you know how they are organizing and using their massive data uh, collective? I'm aware of Truveta. Truveta, I'm also not sure how to pronounce it. 
Um, and, you know, kind of looking at this and um, uh, I think it's a, it's an open question and, and one that um, uh, uh, I don't know the answer to yet. Um, and that's, you know, as an academic medical center, do we want to make um, our data available to a commercial partner like Truveda um, at such scale? Um, and uh, as an institution, Cornell is, is pretty conservative and we have not gone that route. Um, uh, and um, it's, it, it is not clear yet what value um, those institutions that are participating in, in Truveda are getting. Um, and if that is of interest um, uh, programmatically uh, to the mission of of um, of, uh, of every academic medical center. Next one is more of a comment than a question, just pointing out that in Michigan, AA often means Ann Arbor, not necessarily African American. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, MI also means Michigan and not my yeah. other American, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Next question, uh, using, or uh, again, another comment, yep. using notes might not necessarily be accurate. There can be assumptions made about the race, ethnicity that are not correct, need to have confirmation from patient, can be incorrect conclusions based on appearances appearances or interactions. A absolutely, absolutely. Um, I uh, failed to, to provide um, some additional context around that NLP work. Um, you know, when you look at the the definition of race and ethnicity um, from the Federal Office of Management and Budget. I think it's what there's two values for ethnicity: you're uh, Hispanic or Latino, or not Hispanic and Latino, um, and what four or five values of race. Um, and um, that's uh, it's so brittle um, these definitions, um, uh, and those definitions also ignore um, the bigger point of race and ethnicity are socially constructed. Um, these are actually like terrible measures of anything um, because what is, what is it, 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 how do you like, like pigeonhole someone into a box when what we're talking about is like ancestry, which is just so unbelievably complex. Um, and the only way that you can really get to that understanding um, is if you sequence everyone who comes through the door. Um, so um, the NLP approach that we were taking um, we knew um, that it was not perfect, um, uh, and um, uh, we were, and uh, and this has led to some um, uh, very interesting conversations um, uh, with faculty, staff, and students about the limitations of this approach, about the assumptions that go into it. Um, the way that we've really looked at this is um, uh, it provides um, potentially another uh, signal. Um, amidst a lot of noise in the electronic health record um, system, um, that by no means are we saying that um, uh, the values of race and ethnicity that we're obtaining through natural language processing are definitive, um, but um, it's uh, another potential data point that could be interesting um, and could be valuable um, uh, for uh, addressing um, underrepresentation in, um, in, in, in clinical research. Great. The next one is somewhat of a comment, but maybe I'll I'll sort of reframe it as a question, in the sense of can you just maybe talk a little bit more about your your the role you have of a data cleaner and maybe how they are distinguished from other roles and their level of importance and kind of more what they do. Ah, uh, um, uh, great great question. Um, so we have largely built our team around two types of roles. Um, and those being data engineers um, and, um, and, and data analysts. Um, the engineers are largely uh, tasked with um, uh, uh, large-scale uh, ETL, um, extract, transform, load, um, you know, from source systems like Epic, um, and then working closely with our analysts um, um, uh, uh, who engage more with investigators um, uh, so it's kind of bringing those requirements collected by um, analysts together um, with the technical solutions put together by our engineers. Um, and um, uh, some of our engineers have developed um, you know, that uh, 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 great understanding of the nuance, vagary, and complexity of, of EHR data over time, um, uh, but it's a hard thing uh, to kind of develop. Um, so we're kind of constantly working together, engineer and analyst, um, on some of those data cleaning activities. 
um, you know, some some concepts like pair programming and peer review have been really valuable here of, you know, kind of partnering up, um, you know, engineers and analysts, uh, either, you know, in one on one kind of pairs um, or in broader teams um, so that we bring a variety of different perspectives and oftentimes just like, you know, more than one set of eyeballs um, uh, to a task um, as we, you know, constantly seek to address data quality. Um, and it's um, it's quite the challenge. Thank you. We're getting near the end, um, but I also would recommend that anybody who has more questions, please, please put them in the chat because or the uh, the Q and A because we do have a little bit more time. Otherwise, I get to ask my questions. Next question: How big is the team that works on implementing Arch, including transferring data to the various networks like Picornet? Uh, great question. So we've got about thirty people today, um, and that's about thirty people um, just in our research informatics division. Um, and that's really, you know, analysts and engineers, um, uh, uh, along with um, uh, some, some managers and associate directors um, uh, uh, that um, uh, have come about over time. Um, I'd say we're probably 10 people short. Um, it's really, really hard for us to hire. Um, and I think that's a common refrain um, uh, we hear uh, from, from colleagues across the country. Um, uh, it's, it's challenging to hire. Um, it takes probably a year um, uh, for folks who don't have experience in the domain um, to start kind of understanding some of the, the complexity um, so they can be um, productive. Um, you know, the 30 um, folks that we have and in, in, as analysts and engineers, um, uh, that's separate from uh, the folks that kind of run the underlying infrastructure, like say our database administrator, um, uh, our, um, our security colleagues, you know, networking. Um, I think an advantage um, uh, that we have at Cornell of being a division inside of the IT department is we kind of uh, inside the IT department like buy services from each other. Um, and I'm really happy that I don't have to focus on information security and, um, you know, running network cables. Um, um, uh, but, um, you know, there's uh, 30 people or so just in our team. Um, uh, uh, but it takes a, a lot more skills and I'm, I, I feel quite fortunate that we're able um, to work with such a great team here um, that supports uh, not just the research mission, um, but all of the missions of, of the college. Great. Now, as I recall, I don't think we can actually open this up to people asking questions live. I think that feature has been turned off. So again, if anybody does have more questions, please just type them in the chat. In the meantime, since we have a few more minutes, let me ask you some questions. One is how do you demonstrate ROI or return on investment, or are you expected to at all? What what are the expectations for your group to show that you are providing value? Um, great question, and um, this is a, a, a challenging thing for for everyone across the country. Um, uh, we have developed um, uh, a clear understanding with the investigator community that we deliver freight, um, and um, uh, that um, and and we're good at it. Um, um, you know, it's kind of delivering these data packages, and um, these can be for um, uh, uh, large grant funded initiatives um, uh, with you know big data packages to deliver. You know, things like the Cornet, um, and it can also be for you know a junior investigator uh, who's unfunded um, uh, who's looking um, you know to conduct a, an initial study. Um, and it's challenging to prioritize a lot of these things. Um, we rely a lot on, on, on institutional leadership to, to help um, us with that guidance. Um, uh, but I, I think we've um, had success in engaging research leadership um, and having um, IT leadership um, uh, especially uh, Kurt Cole, um, uh, who's now the, um, uh, 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 glo uh, chief global information officer for Cornell University, who is a longtime uh, chief information officer of the medical college, um, really um, convey to um, uh, uh, institutional leadership um, that research informatics is uh, is costly, um, uh, and that if we were to charge um, uh, the full cost of our services, we would never be able to recover it. Um, uh, but that the subsidy from the institution is absolutely critical 
um, because the dollars that come in from these grants likely are not enough um, uh, to cover um, uh, not just the deliverables, um, but I think the the uh, 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 the service level expectation that comes from this of I think investigators increasingly look at um, at, at at data and research informatics as um, you know a utility service, just like email and networking um, that should just be there. There's a little bit more complexity to it, um, uh, perhaps, um, uh, or com it's complex in different ways. I uh, by no means want to um, diminish the the work that uh, security networking and other IT professionals um, uh, provide. Um, but uh, I think we're just probably earlier in our experience of getting um, to do this. Um, and uh, that subsidy is absolutely critical. Another question of mine. Let me just make sure there's nothing else in the q and I sort of lost my, my window here. I don't know why. Well, uh, I don't think there is. Oh, actually, let me go back. No, okay. So here's another question for you, and this is maybe a, a pretty challenging question, which is, are there too many standards and common data models? Are you going to keep supporting all of them forever, or will at some point you pick, or should we all pick a, f a fewer of them to, to support? Um, yeah, that's the old joke. Uh, the great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, OMOP, I2B2, Picornet, like it's a lot. Um, and um, uh, uh, it's not just a lot of standards, it's a lot of work to support all of those. Um, I think um, uh, we've all been able to benefit from kind of OMOP um, as emerging as this kind of lingua franca um, uh, of sorts for, for EHR analytics, you know, supporting N3C, supporting um, uh, Recover, um, supporting um, uh, the All of Us Research Program. Um, uh, it looks like there's more support inside of I2B2 for it over time. Um, it's just, it, it is, uh, I think, underappreciated um, from the research community um, and from institutional leadership, how much work goes into um, uh, doing a good job with one of these data models, let alone multiples. Um, I would really like it if we were supporting fewer common data models and just kind of, you know, doing one. Um, but on the other hand, um, I, I know that you know innovation comes about from um, from doing these things. Um, but you know, I think there is an opportunity here um, uh, for innovation from kind of a, a data engineering, uh, research informatics, biomedical informatics standpoint of um, you know how do we make these transformations from you know OMOP to Coronet um, go more smoothly. Great. I'll ask. One more question because we're just about out of time. Do you have any thoughts or comments about the sort of decisions between centralizing data um, and bringing them all into one place versus the federated model where everybody keeps their own data and then we just connect as needed where, where it never leaves the institution? Because I know there's different approaches right now. You've talked about both of them and any any sense of which one you or Cornell prefers, or which one you think will win out nationally, or they both are going to be doing both? Uh, for wow. The um, uh, um, I wish I had a crystal ball um, to help answer this. Um, it's a really good question. Um, uh, I think we've learned a lot from N3C um, in, um, like, look at what we can actually do when we centralize. Um, and I think that's really worked out well. Um, but, you know, should there be, um, you know, across the CTSA consortium, 60 different, um, you know, enterprise data warehouses for research in each of the 60 um, CTSA hubs, you know, or should we just have one big data warehouse across um, uh, all of the institutions? I think having one big data warehouse, um, uh, a truly massively centralized for all things um, is going to be way too hard. Um, uh, we were able to do it through the for the uh, the public health crisis of, of COVID. Um, uh, could we really do that for um, all uh, uh, conditions? I don't think so. Um, uh, just because from from the optics of it, but when you get into um, doing this, um, uh, just like operationally, it would be really hard. Um, 
you know, when when investigators locally express interest in you know using something like N3C or our Insight uh, Clinical Research Network through through PCORnet, um, I uh, uh, recommend that first they um, uh, do a local data request just from Wild Cornell, so they can get a sense for um, uh, the, the 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 complexity, um, uh, the shape of the data, um, uh, because doing it for one institution is one thing. Doing it across two institutions is another. It gets far more complex, scaling up to you know the five or seven that we have through Insight, then getting to the seventy that are in um, N3C. And if we were to have you know one giant data warehouse for for the entire the, the entirety of the CTSA consortium, like there, it, it is so critical to understand that institution specific difference in data. Um, and you know it might be from that standpoint that. Um, um, uh, we really decide collectively that we should keep things um, uh, behind institutional um, uh, uh, boundaries, but still make it easier for investigators um, to bring those things together um, uh, uh, by, you know, clearing some of those regulatory hurdles. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to point out one more comment in the Q&A, just that Janet, our work, and, you know, we deliver free, really kind of a, uh, Underemphasizes how much work and how complex all of this is. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I'm actually going to turn this over to Lisa, who's going to finish up and wrap up, and, and then we'll be done. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanauer. Yes, I'm Lisa Ferguson, and I am the um, project manager that works with Dr. Van Howling and Dr. Friedman and Kathy Karagiannis on the uh, collaboratory. And I want to thank you, Dr. Campion, for being here today. And uh, this was a great uh, session. Uh, I also want to say that our next session will be in um, April, April 17th. This will be in person. But for anyone who cannot make it in person, uh, we will have uh, we will have it uh, recorded. Um, and please make sure to fill out the post-event survey. Um, we'll have a link to today's recording on our collaboratory uh, archive page. Um, we've already uh, started planning for the next season. Um, so uh, this will be um, in September on Wednesday, um, again, in person. And we're going to try to have our sessions next year uh, kind of loosely around the theme of implementation science and putting uh, learning health systems into practice. So uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Campion. Thank you again, Dr. Hanauer for moderating. And thank you to my uh, colleagues, Kathy Karagiannis and Lauren McCarthy for always doing such a great job with these events. Um, so thank you all. See you next month. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay.